next installment of the Female Executive Leadership Series. We're happy to have the Asia Commercial Leadership Team for Heineken with us today, led by Anna, who is the Sales Transformation Director in Asia Pacific. Welcome. We have Sarah, who's the Marketing Transformation Director for Asia Pacific. Right. And we have Maud, who's the APAC Brand Director for Heineken. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you. I can really feel the passion all three of you have towards this subject. So let's start. First question, Anna, we'll lead with you. Okay. Think back along your journey, whether it's a lesson or a story for you that's unique to being a woman. Uh, the one that uh, sticks with me all the time is that uh, I've always been uh, uh, proud to be the only woman in the room. It happened many times. Uh, I never felt uh, pretty much afraid of it, uh, but over time I have learned to understand what it means to be there and how to really leverage the opportunity and uh, minimize the constraints that come with it. Uh, so my, my, my big story is about uh, getting my seat at the table and, and keeping it uh, and enjoy every minute of the roller coaster. Sarah, over to you. Yeah, I have to say mine's more of a lesson, actually, and it's a lesson that I wish I'd learned earlier, which is why I also want to share it, um, which is that I think sometimes um, women, and, and I'm talking about myself included here, feel a need that, to prove themselves, um, probably more than their male counterparts, and it's something that I've uh, recognized, something that's, uh, that's fairly commonplace. And when you realize this and realize that that's been a driving force in you, um, you know, it, it, it's actually incredibly liberating because when, when you're trying to prove yourself all the time, you have a tendency to overdo things or whether it's always feeling like you have to have the answers. So not only is it uh, personally liberating, but also you get so much more out of every interaction because you're listening much better in terms of actually thinking about other people's perspectives as well. So if I could go back and, and learn a lesson in life earlier, that would be it for me. Well, that's very good advice to all those mentors out there. Maud, your thoughts on that same question? My dad always said, yeah, you have to do the, the best you can. You have to, to try when you want something. But when you want something, you can do it. And he, he instilled in me um, the confidence uh, to go after what I would want, but also to speak up uh, what I wanted. And, and I think that's a lesson that also we as women can give to other women, that it's okay to speak up for what you want and go for what makes you happy. Now that you've become leaders yourselves, when you look at leaders, what are some of the traits uh, that you find are inspiring or motivating for you? Sarah, let's start with you. So for me, the, the thing that I find the most inspiring is those leaders who realize that they're still not the finished article, no matter how senior they are in the business. And to see people who continue to always drive their own development is actually very inspiring. And that sense that you can always be better and you can always do um, things differently and improve, I think, is is something that uh, that really inspires me. Maud, your thoughts? And I think you should stay hungry. You should stay also a bit foolish. Uh, it's a famous expression. Uh, women who who continue to ooze positivity and zest for life. Um, that's what inspires me. Anna, how do you feel about this? So there are two things which I really value in leaders. One is people that are authentic and uh, brave enough to, to become vulnerable and will show a, a blue moment uh, without fear. And the people, leaders that re really have a genuine passion for people, that really care about people. Uh, these people have my unconditional loyalty for life because I think this is really the most important. So if we talked about the traits we look for in our leaders, let's actually think of something specific. What one woman has inspired you? Maud, let's start with you. When I was young, Madonna inspired me. I wanted to be like her. Um, and later, I, I, I would say Hillary Clinton and uh, Michelle Obama. But in a sense, it's about more traits in people that you're uh, hungry to, to continue to learn and, and, and willing to change yourself as well. Anna, your thoughts? 
Uh, I would say one is uh, J.K. Rowling. I have, uh, I, I worship her in every possible way. Not just because I'm a huge Harry Potter fan, then, but also because I truly believe that she has a strong message with her life that can inspire a lot of other people. She is a very humble woman with a great idea. The other one is a psychologist and researcher whose TED talk is one of the most watched ever. Her name is Brené Brown, and she taught me the power of the vulnerability. So when I was exposed to this, my life really had a defining moment. Because I finally learned that a lot of things inside myself I was fighting against were actually a big force inside me. And I started to leverage that. And my life changed really much better. Life-changing, inspirational people. Sarah, that's a tough one to follow. Yeah, it is. But, you know, um, I'm extremely lucky and find myself very privileged to work alongside two amazing women um, who you can see here uh, day in, day out, um, who continually inspire me. So, so that's fantastic. Um, I think one of the other people that I can really think about is actually someone who used to be in my team um, quite a few years ago in the UK. Um, and this, this lady had some challenges with her career, actually. She ended up being made redundant. And what I really admire about her, she's gone on to have a very successful business, uh, which she started on her own, is just this unwavering self-belief that she can. And it goes beyond just her business life. It's a personal life as well. She just continually takes on challenges. Um, she's not afraid at all of failing. And when she puts her mind to it, she shows she can do it. So that courage um, and that self-belief is something that I really admire. And I know is something that sometimes it can be things that people struggle with. During the course of your, each of your journeys independently, have you been exposed to or personally been affected by any unconscious biases or assumptions uh, that are unique to being a female leader? A couple of times when I first moved into to sales and I had to lead um, a group of, of uh, sales representatives who were, yeah, very experienced in, in Heineken. They were all over 50 and they were all men. And and the first thing that I was said, yeah, I'm out, yeah, you're like 25 and uh, yeah, you should work really hard in, in making them listen to you because yeah, you're a woman and uh, you're very young. Maybe for us, who where people appear that beer is a masculine industry, um, that they say, as a woman, can you indeed lead in an industry that is um, historically more male-driven? You do have to overcome a hurdle or a mental bias in a lot of people who will be led. Also that, oh, but my new boss is a woman. So, okay, it's, it's surprising, it's new. But then they realize that it works out pretty well. <laughs> Anna, your thoughts on this question? I think that the most difficult moment uh, when I got uh, to Mexico, uh, because I was there, the first female director in, in the company of 15,000 people, and my husband, uh, who chose to follow me, was looking after the kids. That was completely unacceptable for the local society. We were in a place that was much more provincial. And I took a very long while before we could really get uh, understood in the first place uh, and then accepted and and some others who were really against like you're breaking a scheme i don't like it because i i love to be in the scheme and i know how to live in this comfort zone so so there was a lot of this uh, at, at the end of the day uh, yeah you need to accept it what my husband and, and i always uh, said to each other as long as within these uh, four walls uh, we're good with this choice, uh, we are able to face anything that is outside of these walls. Uh, and that's how we did it. I think also what people don't realize is, is as a female, and if you have children as well, and in my case also my husband uh, went all, all over the world with me, there is a part of yourself as, as a mother and then the mother who is regularly absent at school and the dad who is filling in. Uh, so for the dad that is not easy, but also from mothers, it's also tough to mentally deal and, and, and make that balance in your life. A lot of people think that men, they choose to follow the woman, their, their wife or partner, are weak. 
because they stay beside a strong woman. That's not true, not at all. These are people with a lot of character and personality. It's true for a woman that follows a man. It's true for a man that follows a woman. It's exactly the same thing and no difference. So maybe a slightly different angle just on, I think that sometimes comes down to the fact that People expect that a woman who has got to a senior position is probably quite ruthless and intimidating um, and assertive and maybe aggressive even, um, which is quite clearly just not the case, you know? And, and I've had an experience where, you know, someone has said to me after knowing me that I was expecting you to be fierce, you're actually really nice and uh, as if it's a surprise. Um, and, and I think, you know, this comes from something that's somewhere ingrained and I don't think it's intentional, but this is not uncommon, I don't think. I'd made a judgment based on the role that I'd done previously and had then assumed what I was going to be like as a result of it. Um, there's certainly no malice or intent behind it, but it, it, I think it's one of those things that women sometimes have to deal with. If we take that into perspective, maybe we'll start with you, Sarah. Being a mentor, why is that so important to you? Listen, I think it's hugely important. If I think back to the mentoring that I've received during my career um, and how much a difference it's made to me personally, um, you know, I think it, it's very, very rewarding. But I think more importantly than that, you know, the, the future of our business lies in its talent, ultimately. And the more we can do to encourage and to build that talent and to give them the opportunities um, to explore themselves and their own development and, um, you know, and learn along the way, the better. Anna, your thoughts about being a mentor? Let me tell you a very small story. I interviewed for a job uh, many years ago. I was uh, freshly married in my first marriage. I had two eventually. Uh, and so I was like 25, 26. And... Uh, um, I uh, remember getting to the GM uh, interview. So this was really the last step. It was a big uh, company in the alcoholic drinks business. Uh, and the guy said, you're by all means the best candidate, but I'm not gonna hire you because you just got married and uh, probably you're going to have a baby anytime soon. And uh, I will not invest on a person that is in this situation. And all I was able to say at that time was, uh, okay, thank you for seeing me. And I left. The heaviness of this uh, sentence, the judgment, uh, many years later, and I promised myself that uh, I, I will do whatever it takes not to make any other woman feel the same. Because they need to know, first of all, they're not alone. They need to know that uh, it is possible against the laws and uh, against any written rule and, uh, and that uh, it's worth, it's worth the fight. I can only imagine that you said the word heaviness you feel around it, even still today. Yeah. Maud, your thoughts around being a mentor? My experiences with, uh, with mentees, uh, at first, I was like, yeah, do they really listen to my stories? And then I realized, wow, what you have experienced and what I'm sharing is very valuable. Um, um, and and it's, yeah, we thought you were like this. Uh, you had to, to fight really hard and it, it, it came easy to you. Only some say that as well. But to be able to share, hey, what adversities have I faced from like the boss that was terrible to work with to choosing a career path to be able to help guide that conversation and then maybe, yeah, move someone's career into a slightly different direction. It's great to see that. And then later that they say, oh, now because of the conversation, I had the courage to speak up what I really wanted. And I think that's great uh, to experience that. Staying in the idea of being a mentor, is how can they differentiate themselves? So what advice would you have for them when they ask that question? Anna, I'll start with you. I would say the first thing is uh, always show your true colors. Uh, uh, be authentic, be genuine, and be fearless in doing that. Uh, uh, not everyone will like these colors, uh, but uh, uh, it, it will give such an honest gift uh, that people will appreciate it anyway. 
and uh, by showing your true colors uh, you need to show your vulnerability so so let people know what makes you feel good but also your uh, weak spot uh, and uh, and show people that you're working on it uh, just make sure that it can be turned into your strength sarah your advice i think for everyone there's this sweet spot and it's it's the point where what you're good at and what you love come together and if people can really find that point um then that's when really the magic happens because um it's so much better when you're passionate about what you're doing um so for me that it's really about trying to find that and, and i think you know if you can find that sky's the limit what your thoughts yeah be yourself don't change for what you think that you need to be changed into and yeah, really do what you love and then work super hard for it. But be yourself. And that is not just women, it's for men as well. I could give exactly the same tip to, to men who maybe even more have to, to play to a certain expectation. Uh, we as women are lucky because we are maybe newer to the block at the higher levels, but be yourself. You know, listening to all of your answers, it's very clear and evident why you all three work fantastically together. There's a lot of coming out. <laughs> okay, so we have three questions left. Uh, let's sort of wind it down. We'll start with you, Sarah. How do you unplug? What I really like to do is switch my brain off and pl like plunge into something else. So I'm quite an avid reader. I'm also a very bad serial learner of languages. Um, I love the process of learning a language, then realizing I'm never gonna be able to master it. But things that really help me turn my brain off and focus fully on something else, I, I find that very, very refreshing um, because things that I'm truly interested in and really, really love. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a great distraction. You make for a good travel companion with all these languages. <laughs> Maud, what about you? Well, I... I... I love cooking, I love baking, but to compensate for it, I, I have to work out. And uh, that is part of this COVID crisis that it has allowed me to do a lot of both. So uh, in that sense, it has been good. Every day, do something that, that makes you sweat and then bake something delicious <laughs> to, uh, to make you go again the next morning. Anna? So COVID has been a great treat in this respect because my new office is in my music room. So the piano is just in front of me and every time I've got five minutes, I just jump on my seat and the keyboard. Uh, and when I'm traveling, I listen to uh, a lot of classical music. I listen to a lot of audio books with professors uh, teaching me about classical music. Uh, I, uh, I'm trying to get as much uh, as I can know possibly about Mozart, who's my big idol. So, so that's really what, what uh, makes me get into a completely different dimension, which I love. Uh, so complete the sentence and then answer. My hometown is, and that's important to me because. So we'll start with you, Sarah. Uh, so my hometown is a place called Halifax, uh, which is in Yorkshire in the UK. And um, the reason it's important to me, I, I, it's just a fundamental part of who I am, you know, and it's, I, I haven't lived there for about 28 years now, but I go back regularly, all my family is still there. And I don't know how much you guys know about Yorkshire folk, um, but what I really value about the place is the people and people are known for being very straightforward. Um, what you see is what you get, very honest, sincere, there's a strong sense of community, of loyalty. And those are all things that are really important to me as well as values, which I think is part of, you know, the whole process of growing up there. So uh, it's, it's hugely important and I can't wait to get back there actually once this crisis is, uh, is over. Anna, how about you? So my hometown is a small village on the Lake of Como. I grew up there uh, and that's where all my friends and my memories are. Um, I found it very static and boring when I was a child, uh, but I think uh, nowadays it's one of the most fascinating places on earth. Uh, and uh, just like Sarah, I can't wait to go back. Maud? Yeah, my, my hometown is very close to, to Amsterdam. Like it or not, but everyone has a say, everyone speaks their mind, 
everyone is equal, whether you talk to the prime minister or or uh, to the lady next door. And secondly, what I love about the Netherlands and what I truly believe in is that, yeah, children are raised not uh, technically for success, but about what makes you really happy in, in life. And that, I think, that is also why I think that in general, Dutch people are a happy bunch. Um, and, uh, and that's what I truly believe in. Last question, your favorite home indulgence that you've allowed yourself over the last three months. Anna, we'll start with you. Ice cream. <laughs> Kilos of ice cream. Uh, uh, I'm Italian and, uh, and ice cream is really part of my diet. Uh, so a lot of things have become available during COVID because you were not going anywhere. So a lot of stuff was coming to the house, uh, new delivery services uh, and a lot of new products imported. Uh, and I found a really interesting gold mine of ice cream uh, that my husband and I uh, are really indulging on. I won't stop. <laughs> Sarah, your thoughts? Uh, for me, it's I, I've actually started painting and I'm, I'm completely talentless, by the way. My paintings are terrible. But on the one hand, I feel like, oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm indulging myself in so much time here. On the other hand, I'm enjoying it so much. Um, you know, it's something new. It's something I haven't done since I was at school and I was terrible at it then as well. But at the same time, it's been really a lifesaver for me because it's been something to really get stuck into and, and a distraction, but something that I'm really enjoying and I'd never thought about before COVID. Uh, and I'm definitely going to keep up. What? I always get very happy when I run, but I indulged in a in a, an app and it's called Sweat. And uh, I bought a lot of home workout gear, so I have it all at home. And it makes me so happy every day, in the morning, go for a run. And then to kick off all those little exercises that I have to do from that lady that looks amazing. And it says, now you have to do 20 of this, 30 burpees. And then when you've done that, it makes me so happy. So <laughs> it's a weird one, but I love it. Thank you so much for your time. Anna, Sarah, Maud, you guys are fantastic and hopefully I can see you guys soon once all this ends.